it is with great pleasure that I can announce Emily Briere from the Time Capsule to Mars project to talk about her project. And I will, you know, just give a little tip of what it is about. It will invite us all, us humans, to uh, send our message to Mars to be buried there or be placed there on Mars to be uh, picked out and read for later generations of humans on Mars. And personally, I would be sending a poem to Mars. It's not even my own poem. It's a poem, an adaptation one of my friends did. And it will go a bit like this. Thinking of Mars, I see endless highlands. Big canyons cutting these highlands deep. On the horizon, four improbable high volcanoes. Well, etc., etc. It's actually an adaptation from a world famous poem that really reads Thinking of Holland. But now the word is for Emily Breer and the next younger generation. Oh, by the way, could you all tweet H2M, hashtag H2M, as much as you can? <laughs> Thank you, Artemis, for that introduction. Um, I'm so excited to be here on behalf of Time Capsule to Mars, and I'm excited to talk to you today about our mission, about how it got started. So um, it actually started last year at this conference. We were, a couple of us were sitting around in this room watching the presentations and getting really inspired by what people were talking about. But we were also thinking, there's gotta be a way to re-inspire that Apollo area patriotism, but in, in this new lens of globalism. So the same excitement and inspiration on behalf of mankind instead of just your country. So we were looking for a way to bring that back and also get people excited, get students engaged. And I will say that's one thing that this conference is doing exceptionally well this year. We um, actually received an email this morning from a student at University of Melbourne in Australia who saw the live webcast with a bunch of students in their class and they would love to get involved. And so there's clearly a lot of students watching today, Chris. Um, so it all started, um, where's the clicker, by the way? <laughs> no problem. Right. Um, I want to start out saying this isn't just another student project. We're very serious. We've been meeting with industry partners. We already have a lot of seed funding. We were exci very excited to announce yesterday that we became a formal project under Explore Mars. So we are excited, we're going to Mars, and uh, we hope that you'll come along with us. So I just mentioned it started at Humans to Mars, and so then we got thinking, we have this idea, so where do we wanna go? We, and we picked the destination Mars. And why, why is Mars a good destination? Well, you've heard a lot of scientific perspective, the search for life, namely being one of the most exciting. Uh, but for our generation, it's so bold, and yet achievable. It's just within our grasp as students as something that we can see ourselves having a measurable impact on and, and see ourselves extending and doing the research, the, the technology, and actually pursuing a landing on Mars. So one year later, here we are with this very exciting perspective. And around November, we started thinking, OK, we're going to do this. Um, so what are the main tenets we want to make sure in our mission we encapsulate? So we said we want to make sure we are involving every country in the world. We want to reach a broad socioeconomic uh, audience as well as uh, depth internationally. And um, there are three main pillars that we want to make sure we are addressing. So we want to make sure we're pushing forward technology. So N NASA, all these agencies are constantly pushing forward technology. But there are also a lot of smaller techno technological advances that have trouble making their way into space because it is so expensive. So we wanted to come up with an affordable mission that would be testing a lot of this new technology. Um, we wanted to push forward education. So as students, we had trouble being engaged in space exploration in school. There wasn't a lot of uh, teaching about it. There wasn't a lot of hands-on projects. So we want to get K through 12 kids working on n not necessarily the technical um, parts that will be going into our spacecraft, but get them involved and feel like they are part of something beyond Earth. And then there's the humanitarian aspect, and that's involving everyone, making everyone feel like they're a part of space exploration, which a lot of times, unfortunately, you hear that people have trouble getting involved. And there were even some questions yesterday at the panel saying, how do I, as a civilian, get involved in this? So, so we want to give everyone an opportunity to come along. 
And that's how we came across with our mission quest. So we decided that we're going to build the first student-led, student-designed, student-inspired, student-funded CubeSat mission to Mars. And this will be transporting several time capsules of humanity to the surface of Mars. So not only will we hope this to be based on our planned launch date, the first private mission to Mars, we also expect it to be the first interplanetary trial of ion electrospray propulsion, which is being developed at MIT, and I'll get into a little bit later. And um, it will also be, hopefully, the largest crowdfunded effort in history. Um, oh, and the first interplanetary CubeSat. So it's a, it's a lot of firsts, a lot of technical hurdles, but not dissimilar from going to the moon for the first time, not dissimilar from the American colonists going to another continent for the first time. We're really on the verge of a of novelty here, of something really big, as we move forward as mankind into interplanetary colonization. And we're excited to help push that forward with our mission. So currently right now, our teams are focused at the Space, space, <laughs> space Propulsion Lab at MIT. We have marketing and technical teams at Duke University, as well as University of Connecticut. We're just bringing on this week teams at Stanford and UCSC. And we're continuing to expand to worldwide universities. Um, and the idea is that each team would be given a component of the mission. So avionics, propulsion, communications, to really focus on. Uh, systems integration, and then to bring together all this technical expertise to put, to put forward a mission. So I, I outlined some of these technical feats that we, that we hope to accomplish, and I want to give you kind of a com ops plan of how this would play out visually. So imagine people all around the world, like yourselves, taking pictures now, sending in text, video, photo, whatever you want, you and your dog, you and your child, uh, to, mar to our time capsule. We are going to have a crowdfunded platform, so you pay 99 cents, a dollar, depending on how, much, how many bytes of data you want to upload, and we're going to use that to crowdfund our mission. Then later on, in a couple years, we're going to launch um, three unique and um, at the same time identical spacecrafts. So they're identical in their, the spacecraft, and the payload itself is going to be different um, pictures and videos on each one, and this is in one case for um, making sure we can get as many people contributing as possible, we'll have a couple terabytes of data and we think we can represent several million people. Um, but we also want to, um, it's also a good marketing plan to get people to say, oh, you can, if you want to really make sure that your data makes it to Mars, you'll buy data on all three spacecrafts. So um, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot behind that. but. Um, we're, we have our, the current cost set at $24 million for those three spacecrafts, technical development, launch, everything to Mars. Um, and then we get to Mars. We're going to deploy the payloads. We're not trying to preserve the spacecraft itself. They will disintegrate in the atmosphere. And the payloads are devi designed to aerobrick and self-land um, on the surface of Mars without damaging the data. And then your pictures, videos, you will remain on Mars until future colonists get there to discover you, maybe as extraterrestrial life gets there to discover you, really creating that connection, that breaching the gap between Earth and Mars, and not just jumping to a new planet, but making a connection between our planet and a new planet. So um, there's a lot of technical details that go into the development of a mission that I'm going to get into a bit now. Uh, we conducted back in January a full month-long feasibility study at MIT where we had six undergraduates, a graduate student, and myself leading a team where we did a top to bottom analysis of the mission. We analyzed the cost, the different components, what, uh, what would be the best avionics, what kind of radiation hardening will we have to do, and made this design, put forward a proposal to our advisory board, and they ended up being impressed and gave us the thumbs up to move forward. So right now I'm gonna explore the two different payload options that we proposed. So the first payload option is the idea of using tungsten, thin tungsten sheets. So we're talking 30 centimeters by 40 centimeters by a couple microns thick. And this is an advantageous payload because it is so thin and so light that it's uh, compared to its surface area. When it enters Mars, it will not um, disintegrate entering the atmosphere. So it won't get too hot. It won't reach its um, maximum melting point, and it particularly has great arrow breaking because of its structure. So that was something that was really convenient to us, as well as the packaging. We could slap that on the side of a CubeSat and just deploy it with thermal sensitive bolts. Um, the cons were that while we're microinscribing this data, there's the, the worry that once we're on Mars and there's sandstorms, it might degrade some of the data. So we started exploring a second option, which is the idea of an aerogel shielded media. So if you imagine a, a metal ball such as this filled with the um, 
a very light media that will be encoded with the data, and then surrounded by an aerogel that will act as an ablative shield as it enters the atmosphere. So the aerogel will disintegrate and um, dissipate a lot of energy, and then as we get closer to the surface, uh, the metal ball will act as a cushion for, for the data as it lands on Mars. And while this is more advantageous for protecting the data, it is a little more difficult to package into our CubeSat. So there are pros and cons that we're weighing right now. And I'm sure we'll explore other options in the next few years. Um, in terms of technology, where this is a, in the up left-hand corner is a visual of a CAD drawing of our spacecraft. Uh, on the front, you'll see the inflatable antenna that we're thinking of using. This technology is being developed at JPL and Caltech, and is, seems to be a really good opportunity for CubeSats, particularly interplanetary CubeSats, because it, is, it can be compacted very small and expand to one meter aperture of very high gain, so 25 to 30 decibels. Um, uh, for, in order to have a very high signal. We also looked into using ISARA as another option for our high-gain antenna. And in addition, we're supplementing our high-gain antennas with a low-gain uh, patch antenna or of the sort to um, make sure that we have constant communication with our um, spacecraft at all times. Um, we will be using the Deep Space Network and some other features. We have a camera that we want to use to take pictures. Uh, there's a lot of other technology, including our transponder, but that stuff wasn't as exciting, so I didn't put it on the slides. <laughs> But perhaps the most exciting will be our trial of ion electrospray propulsion. And the reason this is so exciting is because, first of all, it hasn't been tested in an interplanetary setting yet. And it is predicted that it, this technology could be scaled to get humans to Mars in four months. So that is an incredible statement right there. Right now, I'm sure you know we're looking at much, uh, much fast, uh, slower times, eight or nine months. And uh, MIT thinks that this can be scaled to, to get us there much faster. So having be, the ability to test this on a remote a robotic mission first would be incredibly valuable in pushing forward human exploration. And there's also the, the idea that no dollar is wasted in space exploration. We want to make sure that we are getting back an incredible value of science in return and testing out a lot of new technology. So there's also the idea that we're sending three spacecrafts. Why not test out different radiation shields for how uh, to protect the spacecraft, maybe put in some dosimeters, try to get a better understanding of how the human body would be affected in space. So we're, we just got this idea recently. We're just starting to explore it. I remember we heard a great talk on astroomics, the idea of space medicine, at this conference last year. So um, we're just starting to explore this again, and we will keep you updated on that. So now imagine getting to Mars. This is just some diagrams of the simulations we performed on um, the, the two different payloads landing through the surface. So I remember we were on the phone with Bill Nye, and he described the atmosphere on Mars as too thin to ignore, but too thick to help you out. So I'm sure you'll see that in our diagrams, where the, at the beginning, you enter the atmosphere of Mars. The molecules are so far apart from each other, they're, they're, the distance between them is greater than the span of the actual payload. So that's the area of free molecular flow where you're really just nothing stopping you. And then all of a sudden you get into this transition period with a huge shock wave. And that is what we have to make sure that that drag force is what we have to make sure our payloads are capable of withstanding. And then there's the, the gradual slowdown where you enter the area of the Navier-Stokes equations. Um, and that's what we simulated using MATLAB, uh, SOLIDWORKS. So this is just a summary of our um, results. We'd be happy to go further into detail uh, with you later on. A, on that if you have more questions. So that was a bit of the technical overview on how that would work. And now we have to fund this mission. So how do students raise $25 million? And how do they do it in a way that's engaging to the world? And this is how we came up with the idea of a crowdfunded platform. So people from all around the world can send videos, photos. You could send in a audio. Artemis can send in a po poem. Um, and we priced it in a tiered model so that people can pay more for certain amounts of data, and this will help us crowdfund money towards our mission. We've also been speaking with a lot of major corporations who have been um, interested in seed funding, and we're always open to donations <laughs> if you're interested. And so this is just an idea of who we've been talking to. So we've been ha receiving incredible support from the team at ATK, at Boeing, Lockheed Martin, um, Aerojet, they've been incredibly helpful with both advice and just helping us figure out where we're fitting in here. Uh, there's been talk about testing Google's interplanetary internet on our, as a node on our spacecrafts, um, the possibility of engaging with SpaceX. We just brought on an advisor from their team. So we're really a, a, 
expanding our advisor network right now, expanding who we're working with, because we want our mission to be something that goes across all competitive ties. This is something for humanity to get everything excited about. It's not something where we partner with one organization and let them buy their way there. And like, uh, we, we want to engage everyone. Um, and that's something that's been very effective so far. We found that we already have several people on board who are, in fact, competitors, but see this as a common tie. Um, we also, one of the, one of the co-founders of this idea, um, Remarkable Technologies uh, is, has been a great partner and advisor in this uh, as we get going. And they're also the idea of people who we want to get talking to. So there are a lot of great people. For instance, UPS, there's the idea maybe they could put a sticker on our spacecraft for a low cost and we could say, oh, UPS delivers to Mars. So there are a lot of creative fundraising uh, opportunities that we're exploring at this point. So then I want to get into the long-term engagement. I'm sure you've all seen Kickstarter campaigns. They usually go for a couple months. It's not very a, really a long-term revenue model. Um, and in the same way, it's not a long-term engagement model. So this is where we come up with education. We want to make sure that over the course of three to five years, we are having people actively engaged and excited about our project. So we want to have an educational platform where kids can go onto the internet, look at their mission control, do curriculum-based projects, see the telemetry of the spacecraft, say, hey, mom, I uploaded my crayon-drawn picture, and it's currently flying by the moon. And just having that connection between them and space and also putting a scientific spin on it so that they're learning in a way that's really exciting to them. Uh, there's also the idea of corporations maybe sponsoring uh, uploads. So we, we understand that not every country has the money to be able to upload photos, but we still want to represent every country. So we're going to give corporations the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm going to sponsor 25 uploads for this town in Africa. And imagine how exciting it is to a kid to, to go to a kid in a, in a country who's never really been involved in, in space and science technology and looking up at the sky and saying, see that star over there? See that planet? Your picture is going to go there. And, and that has a huge impact on that, on that environment. So we're very excited to, to be engaging students over a long period of time. So how can you help? We're currently building our advisory board, asking a lot of questions, trying to um, climb the ladder and uh, really understand what's going on. We have had a lot of great advice so far, but if you think you'd be a great advisor, we'd love to talk to you. Along those lines, if you think you know someone who would be a great advisor, we uh, would be really happy to facilitate some connections. I should probably change the slides so you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and then we're, we're really trying to get the word out and market and spread the word and, and get people as excited as we are. Because at the end of the day, because we decided to make this a crowdfunded model, even though we knew that you probably could get corporations to fund this, we, w we want to engage everyone and make this something that everyone else feels a part of. And so in that way, spreading the word would be very helpful at this point. So, we are, the whole purpose of our, of, of our mission is to renew the inspirations of an old generation and introduce our new generation to the excitement of space exploration. Get everyone really excited about leaving their mark on a new planet as we move forward um, in, in colonization of a new world. So I encourage you to think about what you might send to Mars, what you would want to leave as your mark on another planet, and how, how you might be inspired to become a, you are already scientists and astronauts, but, but what this could help you realize about moving forward into, into the universe. Um, and in the spirit of this uh, conference being the inspiration of the idea itself, we would like the first photo to be inscribed on the time capsule to be a photo of everyone here today. So if everyone who's interested could come to the stage right now, we'd love to take a quick photo.